Bum, butter, dum. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to BanjoBenClark.com or wherever you're watching this fine video today. And it is a fine video because it's a fine song that we're about to learn. We're going to learn Cripple Creek. Over the years, I've taught a very advanced version to this. I think it was like eight years ago. And then I've gone back and I've created a super simple basic melody. Those that are just looking to pick up what we call those those anchor notes, what, just the very core melody. But this time we're going to strike out for an intermediate version. I've had lots of requests for this. So we're going to stick close to the melody, not get quite as flashy as the advanced version, but we're going to use our scale a lot to create some interesting runs and licks. I'm excited to teach you about that because it's going to transfer not only Cripple Creek, but just other fiddle tunes and solos as we attempt those. If you are watching somewhere else besides BanjoBenClark.com, I'd love to have you on board the site. If you're a Gold Pick member there, you get access to hundreds, like over 700 lessons for banjo, guitar, and mandolin. You can download the tabs and the jam tracks for this lesson, as well as many other advantages of being a Gold Pick member. So thank you to all the Gold Pick members, and I hope to see you over there too. Without further ado, we're going to jump into just a tune overview, because I think we need to understand a bit about this fiddle tune. Then we'll do uh, learn every note, look at everything that we did, and then at the end, we'll do a slow play video where you can play along with me with the tab on the screen. Makes for a great time. So grab that guitar and let's jump into Cripple Creek. Let's do a really quick tune overview of Cripple Creek because it varies, it differs a little bit compared to other most other fiddle tunes. Most fiddle tunes have an A part that's eight measures long, and then it will repeat that so that you have A, A, and then it goes into a B part, which is a different melody and a different chord progression. And it's often eight bars long, eight measures long, and then you repeat that for a total of 32 measures. Cripple Creek, a single solo is gonna be 32 measures, but instead of A, A, B, B, it's going to be A, B, A, B. So let's look at that right quick. So as we pull up the tab here, the first line, is just gonna be the kickoff. That's what we call potatoes. If you're not familiar with potatoes, I have a lesson here on the site where you can learn all about that. But those are just used to establish the tempo and let other people know when to come in. If you're playing this in a jam setting and you're not the one that's kicking off the song, you don't need the potatoes. That's just for the one that's starting the song. Then as we get into the actual melody, you'll see that it's labeled here, first A part. And that's gonna last here from measure seven through measure 14. A Couple things to note. We are in the key of A, okay? But we're gonna capo two, I'll show it up here, capo two, and play out of a G position. So all the chords and the scales that we're thinking of from a guitar player's perspective is in the key of G. So the chords are G, C, and D. But because we have the capo on the second fret, everything that comes out is in the key of A. If you need more help with that capo theory, I've got that on the site too. But because of that, you'll see the little chord notations that I have up here, those are notated in the key of G. So if you're playing rhythm along with this, you would capo up two, you play a G chord, split a measure C, G, split a measure D and G. But because you have the capo on, they're actually in the key of A. All right, after the first A part, what do we have? Like I said, we're going to the first B part. So that's gonna be eight measures long. Chord progression's a little different. The melody's gonna be a little different. As we jump over to the second A part and second B part, the chord progression repeats what we saw previously in those perspective parts, but we're actually gonna jump up an octave and I'll show you and teach you why we're gonna do that. We're just gonna create some more variation here. Then we go into a second B part to wrap up the tune. Okay, so now that we have a grasp on what we're going to be learning, A, B, A, B is in the key of A, we're capoed up to, it's time to actually learn it. So make sure that guitar is tuned up and let's learn. Let me say one more thing about this particular arrangement. I think it's great practice to learn this arrangement just for the agility of your fingers because I created it with some scale runs that aren't typical. Uh, things that you probably have not naturally done before. And so I encourage you to just learn it more as an exercise, you know, and then as far as playing a solo to Cripple Creek, of course, we want to know the melody and we want to know how to improvise on top of those things. And I'm going to give you some tools here 
But you can treat this almost as an etude and just learn some of the acrobatic things that we do here. Nothing super hard. It just gets around a lot. A lot of eighth notes in a row. As I mentioned, we're going to capo two. Let's talk about the potatoes right quick, starting there at the top line. Again, I won't spend too much time here because I have an in-depth lesson on them, but we're going to use those to establish the tempo and also let people know when we're coming in. So it starts with this slide. <laughs> And that's just a signal to everybody listening, like, get ready, we're going to come in, and I'm going to use a G run at the end to land on that second fret. And if you know anything about Cripple Creek, you know that the melody actually starts a beat before the A part comes in. Okay, there's a pickup note, is what we call that. So on the fourth beat of the measure before the A part starts, that's where we get that note. Do -dum -bum -bum. That's what makes you think, oh, that's Cripple Creek, because you hear this. So that's note there at the end of measure six, it's labeled measure six, is your pickup note. So we're going to play it and stay there and slide it into the next line up to the fifth fret. And as we get there, okay, so I ran through that, but what I want you to notice is that all of the notes there are notes in the G major scale. And I think that we're pretty much going to stay there throughout the tune. And that's something, when, when your song is going through the one, four, and five chords, so like G, C, and D, like this song is, and like so many bluegrass songs are, you can't go wrong by playing notes out of that G major scale. There's other notes that we want to play, and there's some of the major scale notes that are going to sound better than others at times. That's part of the decision we make as musicians. But as far as where are your safe notes, you should know the G major scale. Okay, and again, I have a lesson for that. But we're going to grab from those notes and weave in the melody notes. What are those melody notes? I have the basic lesson on the side, but it's... Ah, sorry. Okay, so all of those notes are being hit. I'm just weaving in some scale notes in and around them. Another slide at the end of measure 10. Next line. Okay, so we got a lot of string switching going on, don't we? If you've never done that much, flat picking wise, it's, it's challenging. What I want to encourage you to do is pay attention to your pick strokes. Underneath each one of these notes is a little arrow that's either pointing up or down. So the down arrows mean that I'm going to do a down stroke toward the ground. The up arrows are an upstroke. And it's important here because that helps us create this rolling groove that we want to create. And it can help you with your speed too. Because until you know enough to break this rule when you want to, and, and this rule is broken, but until you know that, I want you to follow these strict pick stroke directions because it keeps you from naturally wanting to do two ups or two downs in a row that actually can hurt you and unless you're doing them on purpose later and you've You've mastered that. But for now, really try to pay attention to that, especially when you're switching strings. It's going to be very tempting when you're switching strings to try to carry two types of pick strokes in a row, either two downs or two ups. Again, there's a time and place for that, just not here if we're learning how to play fiddle tunes. Now we're going to go into the first B part, so the melody changes, and we're going to use a hammer-on really for the first time. I try to keep hammer-ons and slides and pull-offs pretty much absent from this arrangement except where we have to have them. And I just thought, gosh, we've, we need to have them here. And it's a fun lick to do. It sounds like this. It's a lot of fun. Again, we're going to hammer and then do kind of a little cross picking type thing with our pick. Come down to the low E string. We're doing that chromatic run. Sounds great. Next line, continue. Now you'll even hear within this B part and within the A part that there are some repeats going on, right? And so some people would say, Cripple Creek has two A's and two B's, it's just that there are only four measures each, you see? But then when you're in a jam setting, you do end up playing 32 measures. You So it really, I guess it doesn't particularly matter how you divide these A's and B's. 
just knowing kind of what people expect. I have been in jam se settings where people just play it one time through 16 measures and pass it on. That's just not typically the case. You can adapt according to where you are. Okay, so that was that first B part. It's pretty straightforward. It's a lot of fun to do, that hammer-on cross-picking lick. We're going to make it a bit more complex. So as we go into the, the second part of the video here, um, what we're going to do is bring the melody up, both A and the B part, up an octave. And I wanted to do that to show you how to play this melody two different places on the guitar. Let's do that now. As we start the second A part, we're not going to come in with a slide. If you look there at the end of the last B part, we're going to just use a couple eighth notes as the pickup note. But we're going to land here on the third fret, measure 23. I want to land there with my middle finger because I'm going to need to reach for the fifth fret here. And after you get in a position there, it doesn't mean we stay there. We're going to be shifting back and forth between this first position and the 1.5 position or whatever you want to call that, but going back and forth. Notice at the end of measure 25 that we're doing a fourth fret. That note is also the open second string. So why am I doing it there? Well, one is to show you that you can use that and you're gonna use it a lot playing fiddle tunes. It keeps you from having to do a string switch there. Okay, so we could substitute that last note in 25 for the open second string. But what's the other thing that that does if we use the open string? It causes that second string, that B note, to ring out. And I don't necessarily want it to ring out going into that D chord that we see in measure 26. So it's one of the ways for me to control the overtones of the guitar. Okay. Into the next line, it's very similar. We're just going to add more eighth notes and a different scale pattern as we come down. Um, according to your own pace there. That one's a lot of fun to do, and it, it, nothing's hard about it, but it might be a different pattern than you've ever used. I love that tumbling scale that we're using coming down. Now, as we go into the second B part, this is probably the most challenging part of the song. I thought, you know, how should I do this? But in the advanced version, we do things like this. So here I wanted to do a little bit less complex, less um, busy sounding stuff. And then I thought, well, let's bring in some of these ringing strings and some of the cross picking. And it sounds like this. very smooth sounding and it is quite challenging. I had to work on it for a while because there's something about holding down that middle finger on the third fret, which you're going to do measures 31 through 33. You're going to hold that down. There's something about hammering on and then releasing that without picking up that middle finger. That was difficult for me. Just uh, coordination, hand coordination rise. So I had to slow it way down. That ring finger did not want to release on time. Now I'm going to use a pinky, measure 33, to get that fifth fret. It also sets us up to do something a little different and play off that lick, but do something that sounds a bit different in measures 35. So as we go to the last line, listen to the difference. It almost sounds like Black Mountain Rag. So that whole line. That was a lot of fun to write and to learn. So fun. A bit challenging, but nothing too difficult. It's just going to challenge you because you've probably never put your fingers on the fretboard in that particular order. Though you've done other things just as hard, this may test your 
pattern, you know, that pattern comfort because you're just used to doing things another way. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write this version to challenge some of that and get, get our fingers more accustomed to doing what we want to do versus what they just want to do. Okay, so now let's play the whole thing through slowly together. Slowly all the way through. Don't forget that you can change the speed of this video by clicking on the little gear icon. One, two, ready, go. Mm -hmm. 